Good morning and welcome to your TVC News here in Clarence, Rockland. It's Friday the 5th of February. My name is Thomas Stockting and thank you for joining me as we bring you your latest regional update. In your headlines this week, local COVID update, a new health measures in place for schools, a joint effort for a new stormwater system in Prescott Russell, federal aid for businesses to end this summer, local council meeting roundup and staying safe on the ice. We start the show with some COVID news as the Roger Seguin long-term care centre in Clarence Creek had their first case this week as a staff member tested positive. The member of the team who currently works in the facility full-time had no symptoms but tested positive during the weekly routine testing. No other cases have yet been identified and all the staff and residents are being retested this week. With children having returned to school this week, much has been made about the safety measures in place to ensure that there are no outbreaks. We spoke to the Upper Canada District School Board to find out what efforts have been made to make sure that the return to in-class learning is as safe as possible. Well, we certainly appreciate the vote of confidence that we got from both public health units and the Chief Medical Officers of Health, who felt that our schools were being run uh, in a safe uh, uh, and uh, 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 thoughtful manner that was just tending to the well-being of not just our students but our staff, uh, that our uh, enhanced public health measures were in place, and that uh, the vote of confidence we had in that, that while this is a very um, personal and highly individualized decision that each family makes for the, the children in their household, that uh, over 80% of the, the families uh, in the Upper Canada District School Board decided to uh, send their children to in-person learning uh, back to their regular uh, local school. Um, now, with this latest shutdown uh, by the province and with the reopening that's happened, what the province has now required is that uh, to have additional um, face mask requirements, face covering requirements for children in grades one to grade three. So currently already children from grade four to grade 12 uh, are wearing face masking or face coverings as part of, of um, decreasing the, the possibility or likelihood of, of spread of the virus. Uh, with the province's uh, updated direction, uh, we have already implemented the uh, grade one to grade three uh, masking requirements uh, in our schools in the west part of um, uh, of uh, the Upper Canada School Board, so Lanark County, uh, Leeds and Grenfell counties. And uh, when the um, Stormont, Dundas, Glengarry, Prescott and Russell in the city of Cornwall reopen on February 11th, those schools, uh, that those masking requirements will be in place. As well, uh, uh, another development that came forward is a requirement for children to be wearing uh, masks when outside uh, and um, uh, either on recess or on a lunch break, uh, if they in fact could not maintain a two meter distance from uh, their peers. So that's another development and that's going to help. And this is on top of the uh, enhanced uh, hand hygiene practices, the uh, support by visits of public health nurses to all of our sites and all of our sites have had at least one visit to confirm our full alignment and uh, uh, any expert advice that we need to draw upon. Uh, the self-screening that families do and before a child is sent to school, which is actually the most essential practice for maintaining uh, a, a very uh, solid, um, uh, healthy and well uh, school environment is uh, our reliance on parents to support uh, daily screening of their child before they get on the bus or before they leave their home uh, to go to school. So uh, that measure has been in place, as you know, since September, uh, but we are now um, really trying to promote the practice as being an absolutely critical practice for keeping well and keeping schools open. Further measures may be introduced soon, as Dr. Paul Romeliates of the Eastern Ontario Health Unit told the media on Monday night, as talks are in place, to maybe start rapid testing in classrooms. 
Uh, and so our goal really is to limit disruption and allow us to make decisions as quickly as possible. Either we need to test other kids, isolate the class, isolate the children, or in the cases where things come back negative quickly, then the child can go back to school. So I think it's going to help with disruptions. And again, um, depending uh, on the context. So, so for example, you know, we talk about you know asymptomatic testing, targeted asymptomatic testing. I'm not talking about testing kids all the time, and that's not what we're talking about, that gives you low yield. But for example, if we go into a school and we see that a classroom had a couple of cases, um, we then would say, okay, we're gonna target and test all the kids in the class or kids who are asymptomatic around that, that cluster of cases. That's what we mean by targeted asymptomatic testing. Uh, and the testing as well, again, will be rapid test and we'll be able to more quickly and more efficiently decide on what we will do. If we're worried that there's a big outbreak or, for example, in a long-term care facility, we're going to be uh, using, um, and if we need to in schools, we're going to be using the uh, on-site PCR testing as well. So we have a whole uh, toolkit, uh, a, menu, a menu of approaches that we will be doing as well. Though there are plenty of measures in place to help reduce the risk of outbreaks within schools, Dr. Rumeliatis emphasized that prevention is still the best tactic. One of the things that I wanted to also uh, caution people is that, yes, we're getting everybody saying, yeah, testing, where's the testing, where's the testing? You know, the testing is part of our, of our toolkit, part of our approach. Uh, we still, testing is not prevention. Testing just helps us, guides us to understand better the level of infection in a school, level of infection in a child or in a family. Um, we, we, uh, it's not the only thing. It's part of the whole approach, which is screening at the door, screening at home, um, uh, wearing masks, and the physical distancing, which is quite important. So it's all those things that are together. So because uh, I get a lot of questions from the media about, are you going to get a testing? When are you going to do the testing? Testing is important. But yes, it is important, but it's just another part, another layer of the whole overall approach that we have, have to schools. In terms of the local numbers, Prescott Russell currently has 89 active cases, with 21 of those in Clarence, Rockland. The seven-day rolling average remains on a downward trend across the region, which is great news. With the second lockdown due to end next week, Prescott Russell's rolling average is down to 26.5 cases per 100,000 people, which would put the region between the yellow and orange zones. One kilometre of storm sewer is being replaced in saint Eugène in a project aiming to benefit residents by improving the condition and performance of storm sewer systems. This will prevent backups in basements and flooding of private septic tanks and is part of the push from the federal and provincial government to invest in green infrastructure in the region. Over $1 million will be invested in the project, with almost half provided by the federal government. Local Member of Parliament, Monsieur Francis Drouin, said these are important upgrades to the stormwater management system will keep the residents of saint Eugène safe and healthy while better protecting the environment. Canada's infrastructure plan invests in thousands of projects, creates jobs across the country and builds cleaner, more inclusive communities. In Clarence Rockland, residential sewers caused a heated debate during this week's council meeting. The issue surrounds the way in which local residents are being charged for their water and sewer use, as Councillor Don Bouchard explained. For residents to understand, right now, uh, your water bill is based on consumption. So the amount of water you consume, you've got a water meter and we will bill you exactly for the amount of water you've used. However, for sewer, uh, you have a fixed rate, and then after that, it's uh, you're also being billed by the amount of water you've actually used as well. So, for instance, if you're topping up your pool or you're using a uh, sprinkler system, watering the garden, all water that does not go back into the sewer system, well, you're still being billed for it, not only for your water, but you're being double billed because you're being billed for your sewer as well. So it's just a little unfair the way that it's actually set up right now. So what, uh, so what we have right now in the proposed, which is uh, the fixed rate and the variable rate, is also what I would propose as an option five, but the fixed rate to be what it is, but the variable rate to be calculated for the, uh, the average that's being consumed, uh, the consumption from like September to April. So which gives you an idea of regular water use, regular sewage use, 
Um, most people, I would say, use their toilet or do the dishes the same amount of times during the winter as the summer. Um, I don't think there is extra waste of sewer being done during the uh, the summertime. So it would give you a way more accurate reading as to the amount of sewer uh, that you're we're actually using. So in option four, um, when I saw the uh, when, when it says going to the the average for the winter months, there'd be a shortfall of uh, close to $100,000 in it. Well, to me, if we still have the fix rate and then have the use that's being done uh, calculated with the winter months, um, I mean, the 100,000, that's with the 7,000 users we have, that's like $15. So if equity being fair, having a system that's more fair means charging everyone $15 more to begin with, but then you actually have a chance that if you're actually using less water, uh, you know, or you're, you're actually going to get billed for the actual sewer usage you're actually doing. So to me, it just means that, I mean, we want the same amount of money. You look at the sewage system, we, we, that money is not extra money that the city can put in their pocket. Any money that put, goes into the water and sewer bills, that money has to be used for water and sewer. So the end amount of money that we pick up still has to be the same amount. We can't have a shortfall on it. So if the difference is we need to have a fixed rate that's a little higher, so that we have a fair reading after that with the, the winter months, which is more of the, the true usage. Well, I really think that's where we need to go. Otherwise, it just seems really unfair. I mean, the, the resident that I spoke to, he says, I have a pool, I have a, uh, a, a sprinkler system. I have no problems paying more for water in the summer because I use more water, but I'm not using more sewer and I'm making bill for more sewer. So keep the fixed rate but the variable rate to be calculated for the average from September to April, the average use that you get from there. And the top up, like whatever we need to get to the same number, just needs to be added to the fixed rate. And again, if it's $100,000, that's the shortfall, it's $15 per household to bring it up to even. It's not an increase of $15 every year. It's just bring it up back up to par. So if it's $15 to have uh, to be fair in the way that we do it, I think that's the way we should do it. Um, I know that Mr. Dinoyer, and I have to thank Mr. Dinoyer to be very honest with you. He put a lot of time into this effort, uh, consulted with, you know, 46 different municipalities and answered a lot of my questions today, short term as well. So I very much appreciate the word that uh, Mr. Dinoyer did. He also mentioned that he spoke to one of the, um, or he left messages with one of the, uh, the consulting firms who works a lot on these things and he's still waiting for more information. So to me, it's what I would suggest that we have the variable rate based on winter months with a fixed rate that adjusts the, uh, the base uh, amount. Um, or the other option is to defer this item this evening and wait to get more information from the consultant that uh, Mr. Dinoye was in touch with. So that's what I would suggest. So it's, it's option five that I would propose. However, not all councillors agreed with Mr. Bouchard's suggestion of giving a slight increase to the fixed sewer rate to all residents in order to provide a more accurate reading for those using more water but no more sewage during the summer months. Councillor André Lalonde said that water use from activities such as watering your garden weren't essential and that charging everyone else wasn't a fair system either. Mr Bouchard argued that more research needed to be done in to ensure that the system was as fair as possible for everyone and that it merited more research. A point which was backed up by Councillor Mario Zant. Um, Mr Bouchard and I spoke about this today. Um, and on one hand, I, I understand the whole principle of it. But after hearing everybody tonight and, and thinking a little bit through, uh, Mr Bouchard, I hope you don't hate me for this, but I'm kind of trying to reformulate this a little bit. The sewer rate is not necessarily about how much water goes in the sewer. It is really a flat rate of a savings account in order to provide public works and funding that we're going to need in the future. And I think if we were to rename this, because it, it really isn't named properly, it's, it's not something that indicates really a counter that goes into the sewer. It, it really is based on the water consumption. And, um, and but I mean, that said, it, it is kind of a system that's a little weird. The fact of the matter is, is that if 100% of the municipalities were doing the same thing, that'd be one thing. But we have what now one that's doing another, which means that there is a potentially a better way or a different way of looking at things. So I agree with Monsieur Bouchard to defer the items to get at least the consultant's view as to who, what, when, where, how, 
because we need a little bit more information as to what Windsor was even thinking when they started this. But on a separate note, like I said earlier, I think we need to rename that sewer water park because it's it's not just about counting sewer and, and sewage waste. It, it really is that savings account that we need. The council just about voted in favour for the subject to be deferred until the next meeting in order for the administration to go back and look at other options to the way in which residents are being charged for both their water and their sewage. As we edge closer to the end of this second lockdown, there is still much uncertainty for businesses, especially the small locally owned shops which have been hit so hard since the start of the pandemic last March. Some aid has been provided to certain businesses through various government schemes. However, this money can't last forever. I asked MP Francis Drouin about when the financial support may be cut off. Well, the, 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 the cutoff point right now in the legislation is for the wage subsidy, for instance, is June. But we will see and we will um, uh, you know, go back to the drawing board if lockdown measures continue to, to go on. Uh, and, and you bring a, an important point, is Canada, uh, do we have the fiscal power to sustain that on a long-term basis? Uh, the answer is no, we can't do that for, you know, for forever, but we are in a much better shape financially than many other countries in the G7. We can sustain debt um, uh, to, to a certain extent. It's not the 1990s. In the 90s in Canada, we did have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, World Bank and other international organizations had warned Canada that if you don't get your act together, then we will have to step in. And, uh, and, and the proof of that is, is you look at the long-term bond market for the government of Canada, they're still, um, the market is saying, you know what, Canada, we know that you're gonna pay back your, your debt and we, we have confidence that you will pay it back. The credit agencies are still giving AAA credit, credit ratings to Canada, but at the same time, what now we're discussing with the budget right now, so we, we are doing a budget consultation that's coming up um, for March, uh, at some point in March, and we are, I am seeking some, some, some help, some ideas from our business community, uh, but especially our tourism sector and those who supply our tourism sector or those who specialize in the festival areas as well. That's something that I know they've been hard hit, um, and it's an, it's an industry that has been extremely hard hit. And I don't know what the summer will look like, but I, I'm looking forward to hearing from them. And I will be launching consultations, budget consultations with a, a focus on tourism in the next uh, few weeks. MP Drouin emphasised that the best policy for 2021 is an effective health policy, as getting through this pandemic has, will do far more for businesses than just mere financial aid. And finally, over the past few weeks here at TVC22, we have made an effort to look into as many COVID safe activities for people to participate in close to home. Well, with winter in full force comes a chance to try a new sport, though it does come with its own risks. We ventured out onto the Ottawa River with professional fisherman Julien Raymond to get some tips for those thinking of trying out ice fishing this year, as well as a word of caution concerning the dangers involved. So Julia, thank you very much for joining me out on the ice today on the Ottawa River. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your history with ice fishing? When did you start? Uh, I started fishing at about the age of five with my dad. Uh, we would go every weekend for a few hours. And is it uh, something that your dad got you into then? Did your, did your granddad do it as well? Yeah, my granddad used to do it. That's how we, he passed it down to my father and my father passed it down to me. And now I'm passing it down to my, my daughters. Oh, fantastic. You're getting your daughters yes, involved yes. as well. Yeah, they love it. Uh, I hear that your own involvement with ice fishing has gone a little bit beyond what was expected of a five-year-old and uh, you do it in a, in a more of a competitive manner as well. So like, what, how do you um, talk us about some of the stuff you do with ice fishing these days? Uh, ice fishing, usually there's a, a big tournament in Wendover once a year uh, with uh, the Knights of Columbus. They organize it mm -hmm. and we've been doing that tournament for the last seven years now and we had good success in the past. A few first place, a few third place, second place and it's, we do it for fun also but it's always fun to win. So 
Well, absolutely. There is no, uh, there's no shame in taking first place anywhere, is there? No. Um, one of the main reasons we got in touch to speak today was uh, there was a compromising picture of your skidoo that made the rounds <laughs> on social media. So uh, can you tell us uh, what happened and talk us through some of the dangers that people might be facing coming out onto the ice? Yeah, uh, so I think it was last Wednesday night. Uh, I was coming back from fishing. We were three guys and I dropped one of my partners off on the shore and I went back. And when I went to get the second, my second partner, we came back and then uh, something funny happened. The skidoo started to, to sink behind us and then I gave it a little bit of gas and it continued sinking. And we were following another skidoo track and the next thing you know, the skidoo was halfway in the water and luckily we were safe on still on the ice. We got one boot, we got one of our boot wet, but uh, besides that, we're, we were kind of lucky. And like, especially this year, I think the, the water levels are higher. Uh, we didn't have any cold weather, uh, lots of snow that fell on top of the ice. Mm -hmm. So it didn't give the ice a chance to really freeze up and build up to, to, to a safe thickness. So I think this year you really got to watch out where you're going and not adventure too far away from your usual spots that you know that are safe. That's really interesting. So you're saying like with the biggest snowfall we've had as well, it's almost stopped the ice from being able to form as thick as it could with the colder weather we've had. I mean, I know that last winter was a little bit mild, especially in January. And like this year, we've seen some plus temperatures as well. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a change in, um, in ice conditions over the last couple of years? When do you normally start like being able to come out on the ice and properly get involved in the sport? Yeah, yeah, the, the ice condition will change every year. So there's no year that is the same. We always get different weather here, so mm. it, it's gonna depend which kind of cold system comes in and how fast it gets cold. Like the faster that it gets cold early in the season, usually better the ice is gonna be throughout the winter. Because it builds like that base layer to begin with. Exactly, it? like it builds a good eight to 10 inches before there's a big snowfall. So as soon as the snow falls, there's big snowfalls, it insulates, it prevents the cold to go in and build up the ice. And uh, well, the way, one, of the, one of the main reasons we're looking at so many outdoor activities this year is obviously due to the pandemic. So many people are looking for safer activities that they can do during all of these health restrictions. Yeah. So I, I know a lot of people will be looking at new things. So do you have some tips for first timers coming out onto the ice? How thick should the ice be? What are some of the things to look out for to make sure they don't take the same plunge <laughs> or skidoo did? Yeah, uh, well, you always got to check your ice before going on. If you don't know the ice, I would maybe ask the locals or ask somebody that, that went there before. Like, I know some people, would, they see an ice hut far on the river and they think they can just walk on a straight line and go towards that ice hut. But sometimes that ice hut will go around a danger area to bring it to that spot. So, like, uh, the way to, to check the ice would be with the drill. Uh, you just put it on a, a hand drill and when you drill, you marked it at four or five inches. And if you drill all the way to your mark and there's no water coming through that hole, usually it means there's more than four or five inches and you would save to walk on that ice. Fantastic. So four or five inches is a safe space and uh, some basic equipment. Does someone need a fishing rod or can they use something a little bit more basic if they've never tried out the sport before? I with something more basic, I would, re would recommend this tip up fishing rod. Uh, you just put it in the water, you tie your minnow to the hook and you leave it about one foot off the bottom, your weight a foot off the bottom. And this will let the minnow swim in around and you don't really need to do anything except when it goes down, you grab the line, you just jerk it and you catch that fish. Well, fantastic. Well, Julian, thank you so much for your insight today. Uh, just before we let you go, I mean, it's a sport you've been doing for a very long time. As you said, your family got you into it and now you even do it in competitions. Uh, what, what attracts you to fishing? What do you enjoy the most about it? Uh, the, it's the chase, the going after the next bite, catching the biggest fish or finding a new spot and like going out with friends also and family it's a, it's a good activity for anybody to do and 
I like the competition, but during the winter, there's a bit less competition. There's more competition towards the, the summer, during the summer days. But it's, it's all about having fun, going outdoors, spending a few hours. It's good for the, the, the soul, and that's pretty much it. Well, that's perfect. So, Julia, I want to thank you so much. We're going to conclude it there because we're out here today, and uh, my socks aren't thick enough. My toes are getting a little cold. So thank you so much for your insight, and uh, all the best. And I hope the kite conditions continue improving for you. Yeah. Thank you. So that's it for this edition of TVC News. If you want to hear a little more from the interviews in this or any of our previous programmes, you can watch most of them in a longer format on our YouTube channel. We are also actively looking for volunteer and civilian journalists. So if you're interested in taking up a new hobby locally, get in touch with us. We'd love to have you. If you have a new story or a news idea that you think needs more attention, then you can reach me by email at nouvelle with an S at the end at tvc22.ca or by phone on 613-446-6037, extension number four, or of course, find us on any of our social media channels. That's it. Have a lovely weekend, Clarence Rockland, and I'll catch you next week. Goodbye.